Let's take a look at Canon's new EOS R5, which is the world's best mirrorless camera ever created. One thing about the system is, is you easily can get f1.0 autofocus lenses that fit this camera. You can use pretty much every lens Canon has made since 1987 using the various adapters that Canon makes. They make quite a few. One has a control ring, which I prefer. But let's go straight to some pictures. This is made with probably my 10-year-old 16 to 35 millimeter f4 LIS. This is a two-minute exposure at f4 wide open using the bulb timer of the R5. Most of the new Canon mirrorless cameras have a bulb timer, and what that means is you simply go into the menus and program the timer for either two minutes or up to 100 hours. Just press bulb and walk away. Go have a snack, take a nap, come out. It'll just make that exposure. You don't need to use an external timer. You don't need to use remote cable release. Just use the self-timer, and you are good to go. So this is a two-minute exposure. What you see moving here is, is you see the clouds flying above and the star trails. Again, this is with my 10-year-old lens. Looks just great. With the newer lenses, honestly, I love the 24 to 240 millimeter RF lens unique to these cameras. It's super sharp. It focuses ultra fast on this camera. Here's a shot of a macaw. No need for any special macro lens. Just take the picture. And this is at ISO 8000. Down at ISO 100 with the 24 to 240, of course, normal photographs are easy. Things like dynamic range, so many consumers worry about that. It's not worth worrying about. It's a matter of you getting the lighting right. Here we can see from shadow to broad daylight, no problem. This camera is extraordinary for its fast autofocus. In the olden days, we had to settle for Sony's A9 and A9-2, which were from the previous decade, the 2010 decade. This is the first camera in 2020 to come out that does this. Not only does it shoot 20 frames per second, it does it at 45 megapixels. No camera on the planet can shoot that many megapixels per second for still images with tracking autofocus and tracking auto exposure. Here with this Roadrunner, I was shooting my 580EX2 flash on my R5, and it was cheerfully blasting along in bursts at 12 frames a second. Without that flash, we wouldn't have the bird's face lit up like we have it. And <laughs> we get a really dull, awful picture. The key is it's even super sharp here at ISO 1600. And again, the 24 to 240 millimeter lens focuses ultra fast. If you want exotic lenses, I mean, I showed you the F1.0. It's Canon is the only system in the world with an F1 autofocus lens. Here's a shot with the 85 millimeter F1.2 L USM DS defocus smoothing RF lens. The key is that this shot and this lens, I'm not showing you its defocus abilities here, which is actually the smoothing of the out-of-focus areas. The in-focus areas of this lens are probably the, <laughs> probably the sharpest lens ever legally sold to the public outside of things like satellite and intelligence use. I can zoom in here, and I can read the tiny print off my old tires on my bicycle, even at bigger than life size. And this is at f1.2 wide open, where most lenses are at their softest. Again, you can't get lenses like that from Sony or <laughs> from Nikon. For normal stuff, here we go. I mean, just a cloud. I love this camera. Another beautiful thing about it is much better than Sony, much better than Nikon, certainly much better than Fuji, is the menus make sense, and I can just pick up my camera and go. That macaw shot that I showed you, I shot that. I walked into a bird store, and I was snapping away. Lady got me within a few seconds and says, hey, no pictures. The point is, I already had my picture, so I was good to go. If I had the futz with menus that I couldn't figure out, there'd be no picture. This camera works great. Actually, all of the Canon mirrorless cameras work great with tele-extenders. This is shot with the 800 millimeter ISSTM RF lens and the RF 2 times extender. This is the full frame shot at 1600 millimeters. I actually did use a tripod for this one, so I could shoot down at a 60th of a second at ISO 200. But to be honest, at this, you can't really shoot at any slower speeds because the moon was moving so fast due to the motion of the Earth, you could actually see it moving slowly through the finder. So by the time you get to about a 30th of a second, you're going to get moon blur. <laughs> That's the way it is. Okay. Back to our camera. Again, I love this camera. Everybody loves this camera. The thing is so selling so fast that as it is writing in August 2020, I've seen people pay. And you can just go to eBay. Follow my links from the review. Go to eBay. Click on the results for sold items. And people, as of now anyway, are actually paying $5,000 a piece for these things used because you just can't get them fast enough. Nobody cares about Sony anymore. <laughs> Old news. And their crummy menu system and crummy ergonomics. When I say ergonomics, that's how it feels. What's beautiful about this camera is everything is curved. There's no straight, hard edge anywhere on this camera, so it feels soft. And when you shoot all day, as I do, your hands don't get all cramped. The grip is good. I've got big American hands. It fits pretty well. You notice everything's in an angle. It's not that it's like, 
<laughs> some of these cameras are coming out of non-camera bands today are designed by VCR makers, and it just it might look good on a shelf, but it doesn't feel good in your hand. Every single one of these buttons is in a different location, and I can identify it by feel. For instance, it doesn't seem that important here, but this Q button, the quick control screen, is further down and, and set into the camera more than this info button. So while I'm feeling around, they all have different shapes and sizes and locations. And so, for instance, ah, you know, you can't even see it here. But what's important is, is this trash button is a little further indented. Can I show this? It's hard to see. The trash button is a little further in. So as I'm feeling around, I know this is play. I know this is trash. I love that. I don't like that the menu is on the wrong side of the camera, requiring a second hand to hit it. But I program this button here. I don't shoot video on this camera. I'm shooting this video on an iPhone because I get better results with faster autofocus than I do with an interchangeable lens camera. I just reprogram this red button to be my menu button. So when I tap that button, boom, by tapping that. Another thing that no other mirrorless cameras got is a built-in voice recorder. You see this? Sony made a big press release about, oh my gosh, the A9-2 finally has a voice recorder. It's horrible. You have to go in the menu several layers deep to record one, and then heaven bid you want to add to it or change it. Forget about it. With this, all I have to do is press and hold this button, and I show you in my user's guide. Uh, there are links to everything I'm talking about in the description of this video. The key is just hold this button down. I can record a voice note on a picture I just shot. The key is for news and events, I can either give the spellings of people's names or sometimes I'll hold this down and hold the camera to people and say, hey, would you please spell your name so we can get it right in the newspaper? Or maybe I'll make a note of who is in the picture or what the picture is of or, or what was special about that picture. And those notes are recorded as the same file name but with a WAV file extension. So when you sort these all out, they sort right again, and the WAVs are the audio files. There's a top LCD which is this here. It's actually extremely visible because it's a black and white LCD. You guys may not remember those, but those are fully visible in daylight and even dim light. There's a luminator for that, which doesn't work that well. Personally, I prefer the R6 and RP's mode control dial. This doesn't have a mode control dial. It has a mode control button. You tap that, and then once you tap that, wake up our camera, tap that. Now you can turn this. It's too difficult. Honestly, I want to pick it up and just go C1, C2, C3 just by feel, which I can do on the other cameras. But hey, maybe you prefer this. Oh, and why is this the world's best mirrorless camera? Well, again, it's a totally unmatched and uncontested superiority of a combination of resolution, frame rate, and technical image quality. It has a superior finder, and the ergonomics are superior, and so is the customer support. In the United States, call 1-800-OK-CANON. You're going to get a native English speaking. When I'm the customer, I expect service, and Canon gives us that in spades. Anytime I've called with a question, I got a knowledgeable person who right off the top of his head knew the answer to my question. That's important to me. As I showed with the bird picture, it easily tracks autofocus at 20 frames per second. It automatically tracks the bird all over the frame, finds his eyeballs. It works great. Of course, you do need a lens that focuses fast enough. The funny thing is the 24 to 240 focuses ultra fast. But if you get a real science type lens like the 85 millimeter f1.2 that I mentioned, that focuses very slowly to get enough precision for the ultra fine autofocus that it needs. So not all lenses focus as fast as others. What's new is we have dual card slots. I personally prefer the SD cards, and if you want a CF Express, you've got that. Here's the key. People ask me, yes, you can pop an XQD in there, but no, the XQD card won't work. You'll get a bad format warning, then I'll try to format it. Just won't work. It's not supposed to work, doesn't work, even though it does fit. Autofocus is smart enough to detect people and faces and eyes, and it's also smart enough to tell the difference between animals and people and just deal with it. The Sony cameras, at least as of August 2020, aren't smart enough yet. They said, wow, we have now animal eye identification. Yeah, but you have to go in the menu and tell it to look for animals or tell it to look for people. It won't do both automatically, which kind of takes the fun out of it. Many consumers get all excited about the concept of in-body sensor shift image stabilization. I don't. Sensor shift has never been the best way to do things. It sounds good on paper if you're a consumer and read the <laughs> marketing materials from the manufacturers, but it can't work well in the corners. Look at my review of the Sony 12 to 24 millimeter f2.8 where I show concrete examples of how image stabilization doesn't work with sensor shift in the corners of an image because it can't. You need a rubber sensor that moves more in the corners. Likewise, for ultra telephotos, it won't work well with sensor shift because the sensor would have to shift too far. The best thing is to use in-lens stabilization. But the nice thing is this does have in-body stabilization. I get two stops with the 85 millimeter lens. It's unstabilized. But honestly, if your lens has stabilization, I get little to no additional benefit. So if you're thinking you want to get this just for the in-body stabilization, as a lot of consumers do, because it's a new feature now and the cameras are just starting to bring it on board, it's not significant, meaning it doesn't add that much when you use it with a stabilized lens. The camera is marvelous. It runs up to 12 frames per second with its mechanical shutter, which honestly is quiet. It's quieter than a lot of Leica's are. 
The silent electronic shutter runs at 20 frames per second, but a move on with flash, none of the electronic shutters do. Also new for this camera is we have this big rear dial. I mean, this has been a fixation on all the Canon EOS cameras since they came out in 1987. Some of the more basic cameras don't have that, like some of the earlier mirrorless, but this one now does. You have dedicated Q and magnify buttons. Usually <laughs> the earlier cameras shared those. It seems simple, but this power switch now adds a little lever there. So I can just tap it from the side with one finger. I used to have to push it. These are all subtle things, but to be honest, when you shoot this all day, every day, it's really important. New is a clarity setting in the picture styles. I don't use that. I leave it at normal. New is an option to keep the shutter open or closed. The problem is a lot of lesser brands like Sony and Nikon are always got their shutters open when you open up the camera and take off your lenses. The problem is now your sensor is sucking all the dust in from the universe <laughs> and getting it on itself. The nice thing is most of the sensor cleaners work reasonably well. And of course, this also is a sensor cleaner. But I love the fact that my shutter closes. Now, you have to be careful. Sometimes you'll get a menu warning saying, look, make sure you have a lens cap on. And the reason why is if you take this F1 lens and leave it on a picnic table and the sun comes cruising by, you're going to melt your shutter because the shutter is black and absorbing all the infrared the sensors usually have an infrared reflective mirror, so they don't get as hot, and it's not as much of a problem. But the good news is this camera is so great that you can have a menu setting at menu wrench 4, shutter at shutdown, where you can tell it to either close the shutter or leave the shutter open when you shut it down. So you've got both ways. There's a new HEIF image file format, which for mathematicians is more elegant in that you can get a 10-bit image in the same file space as an 8-bit image from a JPEG. I don't use it because much like RAW, it's not as standard as it should be. Most software cannot read these files. Make sure you can read that file before you go on vacation and shoot everything in HEIF and discover that you can't use it. Also, you can't send them to people. Don't expect that anybody has the ability to read it, so you'll be converting back to JPEG. So I don't use that. There's a newer, higher capacity battery. It's also cross-compatible with the old ones. It's got a beautiful 5.76 megadot at 120 frame per second finder. There's an optional battery grip. There's an optional wireless file transmitter. The real world battery life is incredible. I can shoot over 10,000 shots. I'll say again, 10,000 shots on my third party Watson battery. I'll show you a little later. <laughs> I've got, I shot like 2,000 shots and I had used like 5% of the battery or something. So the key is if you're shooting continuous sequences, you can shoot almost forever. If you're stopping at every shot, looking at the menus, changing things, taking another shot, looking at the playback, you'll probably only get the few hundred for which it's rated. But if you're actually shooting, and not so much looking at everything play back, you'll get a lot more frames for a battery charge. You can get live RGB histograms as you shoot in your finder or on the rear LCD. That's something that neither Sony nor Nikon can do. With Sony and Nikon, you have to stop, play back the file, check the histogram and color. And if you don't have a color histogram, unless you're shooting in black and white, you're going to blow out your reds. For instance, that picture of my bicycle I showed you, my orange bicycle. The reds easily blow out in bright orange like that in small areas. You need the live RGB histogram in your viewfinder so you don't have to sit around and go back and forth between playback and shooting to get the exposure set right. It's got 4 to 3, square 1 to 1, 60 by 9, and APS-C as shots crops. It's got focus bracketing, so you can stack them later in software, but the camera can't do focus stacking internally. You have to stack it yourself later. It's about as weather-sealed as a 5D series, which is good, but not as good for shooting out of the pouring rain continuously like a 1DX Mark III. But thankfully... I'm at the stage of my career, I don't have to stand that all day long shooting in the rain. I'll either have somebody hold an umbrella or I'll just stay home. It's also made in Japan. It's not offshore to China or someplace else. It's quality made by people that really care about quality more so than saving themselves a nickel. The only things bad about this, besides not being free and the fact that nobody can get them because they're so incredibly popular, is that the specifications say if you're shooting 4K or 8K, it might overheat after about half an hour. Then you have to cool it down for 10 or 20 minutes before you can shoot again. But I don't shoot video, and I shoot it on my iPhone that runs forever at 4K and has no problem at all. There's also a rolling shutter effect with the electronic shutter. So if you're shooting stuff and going brrr, like this, you may get smeared vertical lines, as most cameras have done. I will admit that the Sony cameras have a very special way they read the data out from their sensors. So if that in particular is important, then you might want to look at the A9 or the A9 Mark II. But to be honest, that one thing does not bother me. But I would pay attention to that, especially, too, if you're trying to actually stop motion that's going across the frame. For instance, maybe a ball. You might get a different shape. But if you're tracking the ball, then that's not a problem. But watch out for that. Also, too, if that is a problem, shoot at the 12 frame per second rate with the mechanical shutter, and there is no more rolling electronic shutter effect. The only thing's missing, there's no more touch bar from the EOS R. I never liked that touch bar anyway, so good riddance. It's got a multi-way thumb controller. 
The electronic shutter only goes as fast as an eight thousandth. It doesn't go up to 32 thousandths. There's some crazy speeds, like admittedly, even the iPhone goes up like a 50 thousandth of a second with its electronic shutter. But eight thousandth is it. There's no automatic brightness control for the rear LCD or for the finder. But what I do is I use the C2 mode for outdoors, and it actually saves and recalls the brightness settings. So I simply pump up my finder and pump up my rear LCD to full brightness, and I save that. And then every time I go outside, I just choose C2, and it looks great. And it works a lot better than Nikon or Fuji's automatic brightness controls in their finders because those finder automatic brightness controls don't work well in those brands. Sony's the only one who really has it right. Canon's the only one who has it right for the rear LCD, uh, in addition to the iPhone, but they didn't put an automatic brightness control in this like they did on my 5 DSR. The top LCD is great because it counts up in minutes and seconds during bulb exposures, but you can't illuminate the LCD at night while you're in bulb, which I thought was something you'd want to do. The good news, too, is on the bulb timer exposures, it'll count up. But honestly, I don't care if it counts up. I want it to count down until it's done. And even though there's enough room on this little LCD to do that, it doesn't do that. Minor things. There's no built-in flash. The buttons are not illuminated at night like every telephone I've had since the 1980s for use in the dark. I think all cameras should have that. It's not exactly new technology. There's no GPS. I'm told you can use the app for that. Some specifics of performance. For manual focus, you have 6 times or 15 times magnifiers. There's an in-finder focus distance scale. There's also focus peaking with a lot of options. Again, all these are explained in my Canon R5 user's guide, and you can find a link to that in my description. The finder looks great. This is an actual photograph looking through the actual finder optics. What's extraordinary is, is if you look at my other reviews where I do photograph through the finder optics to show you what the finder really looks like, the picture's usually pretty awful. They're usually distorted. In other words, the straight lines aren't straight. And honestly, in my other reviews, I usually correct those because it looks worse in the picture than it does in person. This finder looks fantastic. It's a subtle thing, but the size of this rear eyepiece window is larger than most of the other cameras. Canon has actually made a thing. It's sharp from edge to edge in every place in the finder. I find it's very rare. Even some of Sony's expensive cameras don't do that. So I love that. The finder is super sharp. Not that it matters for photography. The pictures are the same. But it's nice because it's got a very sharp OLED screen, and the optics here are sharp enough to let you see how good your screen is. High ISOs work great. Some consumers get afraid. They're like, oh, my gosh, it's a lot of pixels. It will work well. No, it works fine at higher ISOs. It works the same as lower resolution cameras. The reason you sometimes will see higher ISO settings, for instance, on the R6, is not because it looks better or worse. It's because the amount of computational horsepower required to process all those pixels and do the noise reduction outruns the amount of processing power they have, and that's usually why they limit the highest ISOs. So here's a shot at ISO 12,800. It looks fine. But if we look specifically now, these are the full frame images. And I'm going to start at ISO 50. ISO 50 is a pull ISO. Some of the consumers are concerned, that, oh, you lose highlight dynamic range. Well, not really. Yes, you do, but you get more highlight contrast up until you finally wash out the highlight. If you look at one section of the clock glass, and I'll show you that in the magnified sections, it will clip a little more. But also, as I'll show you, you get more shadow detail. So the dynamic range is the same. You just shift it a little bit. Uh, I love ISO 50. I'm a film shooter, and I get less noise. And if I can, I just watch my highlights. I'll shoot at ISO 50 all day long. But the great thing is this camera, other than that highlight and shadow difference, at every ISO, things look the same. So when you're looking at normal sizes like I'm showing here, you can get up to ISO 25,600. I don't really see anything different. The great thing is you can use whatever you need. And if you're just showing the whole image like this at a normal, rational, human size, it's going to look great. At ISO 51,000, you get a little bit of color modeling. It's not a big deal, but a little bit. A little bit of magenta green kind of blobs. It gets worse at ISO 102,400, which is completely insane. But that's to be expected. I don't like high ISOs. I'm a, <laughs> I've been shooting over 50 years. I know how to shoot at low ISOs. Low ISOs always look better. That shot I showed you of the palm trees at night with a two-minute exposure... Well, the reason I use a two-minute exposure is like I shoot down at ISO 100 and get superior sharpness and superior shadow detail and a superior image that most people don't know how to make because consumers are somehow misled by camera companies into buying new cameras because they think that higher ISOs leads to better low-light performance. No. If you've got a tripod and the subject's holding still, shoot at ISO 100 or ISO 50. These are 13.7 times magnifications from the shots I just showed. These are 600 by 450 pixel crops from the above images. Now you'll notice at ISO 50, the highlights are a little bit, a little bit brighter, actually. They're a little bit brighter, a little bit more spunky. I like that. And as we go up in the ISOs, the biggest difference is 
is you'll start to lose definition in the finest detail. And the reason for that is on every digital camera that the noise reduction is smoothing over the details at the same time it's smoothing over the noise. So by the time we get to say 25,600 and above, some of the finest details are gone. And that's the trade-off you make for not getting ridiculous amounts of noise. And at the very highest ISO, this actually looks good. I can actually see the individual minute ticks at ISO 100,400. Most cameras, those minute marks are gone. You maybe see the five-minute marks, and a lot of cameras see nothing but the numbers. So this is excellent performance. But here's something people usually don't look at. Let's look at the shadows. Now, here's from the same photograph, the same magnification. Here are close-ups of just the shadows in the grill of the fireplace. Now, at ISO 50, you can see everything. The grill is sharp. The screen is sharp. The bricks behind it are well-defined. As soon as you even go up to 100, you'll notice there are some regions where the screen is a little less sharp because the system doesn't really know which is noise and which is supposed to be there. And as the ISOs go up, things start disappearing. The screen eventually completely evaporates, as well as the bricks behind it completely go away. And it's funny, people talk about pictures being uh, exact representations. No, they never are. There's stuff being removed here. And so, again, the lower ISO you can shoot at the merrier, at least if you're looking at incredibly high magnifications like this, which most people never do. And by the time you get to ISO 100,000, there's no detail in the shadows, just noise. And that's typical. Back to the mechanical quality of the camera. What's metal? Well, the top panel, the strap lugs, the hot shoe, the back panel, the lens mount, the car door hinge pivot. Not the car door, but the hinge pivot itself. The battery door hinge pivot, some of its hinge, and the tripod socket. Everything else is plastic, except for the IP shield and the grip coverings and all the connector covers, which are rubbery plastic. These little guys here are rubbery plastic. Image stabilization. I get about two stops of real-world image stabilization improvement with an unstabilized 85mm 1.2 lens. Now, when I'm standing, not touching anything, having no bracing or anything, I can shoot with no stabilization down to 125th and get perfect 100% tripod equivalent sharpness most of the time at a 125th. With the stabilization turned on in the camera, I can get down to about a 30th. I saw a Canon video where they claimed a two-second sharp picture. Well, they weren't as picky as I was about what constituted sharp, and they had to try a bunch of times, and they admittedly were not uh, just freestanding. So here, I tried it here. Here's a shot. This is a two seconds with an 85 millimeter 1.2 DSD focus smoothing lens, and it's sharp enough for, <laughs> for real work here. But again, I also have to shoot a bunch of photographs and pick out the sharpest one. So it all depends on how picky you are about sharpness and how many shots you want to go through until you get a sharp one. With the 24 to 240 millimeter IS, I can handhold it most of the time with perfect sharpness down an eighth of a second at 85 millimeters. And that's with the stabilization turned on. When you use this camera, there's no setting for this in-camera stabilization versus the lens stabilization. When you turn the lens switch on or off, it controls everything at once. Power and battery, as I said, here we go. Here's that shot I was promising you guys. Here's a battery info screen. I'm still at 92% after 1,400 shots, and that was mostly sports shooting. And I was shooting at a small JPEG size because I don't really want to shoot 45 megapixel images because it just fills up cards too quickly if I'm shooting sports or anything that I'm shooting at high frame rates. But that's just me. This is my Watson LPE6N battery, and there's a link to that in my description, which is a third-party battery, which seems to work okay as well. And that's about it. I love this camera. Everybody loves this camera. And this is the Canon EOS R5. Thank you very much for watching Ken Rockwell, kenrockwell.com and kenrockwell.tv. And if you like what you see, yeah, of course you can subscribe. But the most important thing to me is that when you're getting your gear, my biggest source of support is when you use the links in my reviews to get to the stores I use. I've used these stores, some of them like Adorama and B&H. I've shopped at in person since the 1970s. Over 40 years I've been their customer. They've always treated me right. And that's why I recommend them so highly. And if you use my links to get there, that's really what supports me. So thanks again for watching KenRockwell.com, KenRockwell.tv, and I'll see you in the next video.